All right, let's pray. Father God, we come to you, Father. We seek your guidance and you seek to teach us about moving from disobedience to renewal and forgiveness. Father, give, give us clarity. Use me to speak your word, my word. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Turn to your Bible. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Starting at verse 1, Miriam and Aaron spoke, spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. For he had married a Cushite. And they said, Has the Lord indeed only spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, not, not so with my servant Moses. He, he, he is faithful in all of my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth and clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud we removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was a leprous like snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to my and Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us, because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let, no, let her not be as one dead who, whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried, Lord, O oh God, please heal her. Please heal her. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she, she, she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from a Mehezroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. I want to talk today about the steps from a, a disobedience to renewal. John was walking home with, with his friends. His friends started to say, why don't we steal the test that we have to take on Friday? John didn't say anything. But one of his friends said, what if we get caught? Another friend said, we won't get caught. They'll never know. So John and his friends conspired to steal the test. And they stole the test. And they took the test on Friday, but John and his friends, when Monday rolled around, they, they were all called into the principal's office. 
John and all of his friends would be a the principal as well as the teacher. And the principal asked them, all of you got the exact same answers. All of you guys got 100%. Did you cheat to get this 100%? Every last one of them said no. The principal said, I cannot prove that you cheated. So what I'm going to do, you're going to take this test again. And if you score significantly lower, there will be severe consequences. So each one of them took the test. And each one of them scored significantly lower. The principal had both the tests in front of them. And he asked him, did you cheat? At this point, one by one, he said, yes, he cheated. John and his friends are fearful for what may happen to them. John is wondering how he got himself into this, how he allowed himself to fall into this place that he's now in. Possibility of severe punishment because he did nothing and he just went along with it. Some of you may have been in a spot like that before where you were in the one wondering, how did I get here? How did I go from not doing anything and just following along to now being a man actively engaged in something that you never saw coming? Our text describes the steps from a uh, the steps from a uh, the steps from a uh, the disobedience to renewal. First, first it starts off. Um, because of our indifference towards sin, that, that will inevitably cause me to be actively engaged in it. Number two, God rebuking us for our sin and us pleading for forgiveness from God. My first point, our indifference to sin leads us to joining others in their sin. Look with me in verses 1 through 3. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because he married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Is that, is that the only one who he's spoken to? Has he not spoken to us? And, and the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. Aaron is Aaron is the high priest of Israel. Mar Aaron is a lead leader, but far too often Aaron is more of a follower than he is a leader. In Exodus chapter 33, the people want to make an idol. And what does Aaron do? He doesn't I'm going to rebuke them, but what he does, he goes along. Now, in the second occasion, Aaron follows his younger sister. It, it's, it, it's, it's almost unfathomable to, to think an older boy would follow along with his younger sis, sister. But that, but, but, but really, that's how it is, isn't it? You don't do anything and you don't say a word. And somehow, you have a group of friends. This group over here is just slamming your other friend. And, and, and you don't say a word. And somehow, along the way, you find yourself talking about your friend over here. As the saying goes, you are who you hang around with. Aaron doesn't have a backbone. And sadly, very sadly, very sadly, Aaron 
gets himself into so much trouble because he doesn't stand up for what is right. We see two things in this text of sins that Aaron was indifferent towards. First, Aaron is indifferent toward racism. And the text says, because Moses married a Cushite woman. Moses. Now, a, now a, um, the Cushite is from the portion of um, the Ethiopia. So the idea here is that she, she doesn't come from where we come from. I can't, and, and, and we can't have Moses as our lead leader when we have to look at her. I don't want to follow Moses while I have to look at her. Brothers and sisters, for the book, for um, the believers in Jesus Christ, There's no room for the church for racism at all. Racism is a gospel issue. Because it implies when I treat people differently because they don't look like me, it implies God did something wrong by creating me like that. It hits at the heart of the gospel. And it not only says God did something wrong, but it also implies is that if you don't look like me, then God didn't create you. That's implied in racism. And this is why God deals with it so harshly in this text. So harshly. And it also, it hits at the gospel. Because in the gospel, God has created everybody uniquely and wonderfully and beautifully and desires a and desires a, a relationship with everybody Re regardless of where you come from that's why god deals with it so, so severely and what's implied here is the word spoke is in the feminine which would imply because it which would imply that marrying is the one who initiates it all. Second, Moses, Aaron is indifferent towards Moses' unique leadership in relationship to God. They say, Moses ain't special. God speaks to us the, the same as he speaks to him. He isn't unique. But isn't that how leadership goes? You see someone in a, um, a position of authority and you say, I can do what they, they do. That's the problem with pride. It has a, uh, pride has a, um, an elevated ego of himself. When we judge, when, when we make a, um, a ju judge judgments upon leadership, it implies God, you did something wrong here. It hits at the face of God's will and his plan. He, and somehow, you have better wisdom than God. Pride has an elevated view of itself. And the truth of the matter is, pride hits at the core of each one of us. We all are prideful about something. And the problem with pride and the problem that we have when we're the best at everything, there's always going to be someone around who's smarter than you, more skilled than you, has more uh, authority than, than you. And that's the problem with pride. And, and the challenge for today is how do we confront pride? What do we do so I stay humble? For me, that I surround myself around people who are smarter than me, people who know a whole lot more than me. I surround myself around those people. 
it a lot it, it really allows me to it, it really a amount humbles myself so that I will not have a super elevated uh, position of myself. And the issue is pride. When, when we are prideful, we are imitating Satan. We are saying, Satan, your plan for my life is more de desirable than God's. We're saying that when we want to act in a way of pride, when, when that's what we do, I would rather follow Satan to hell than to follow Christ to heaven. Pursue humility and be like Christ, who although he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So he put on the clothes of a servant. Our indifference towards sin leads us to joining others and God judging our actions. Point number two, God rebukes us for our sin. Look with me in verses four through nine. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, come out you three to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forward. And he said, hear my word that there's a prophet among you. I, the Lord, make himself known in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. We're with him. I speak mouth to mouth clearly. Not in riddles. And behold, the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Whether you are passively engaged in sin or you are actively, God will judge your sin. He must address your sin. The first, uh, we see two things from this text on how God addresses the sin of Aaron and, and um, the man Aaron. First, we see it, God addresses sin implicitly. He calls them out. Moses, Aaron, and Mary. Come to the tent of meeting. Before God addresses your sin, before he addresses it directly, he's going to first address it indirectly. And he's going to do to this through the word, through a person, or through a song. And, and then the, that is a warning. You need to make it right because the consequences are about to come. I remember when I was a lot younger, um, I was one of a, um, a jokester in school. I would make jokes and I enjoyed to have fun. Well, it got to a fever pitch one time, and my mother told me, my, my mother and father said, if you joke around in class one more time, there will be consequences. Guess what happened? I joked around. Because I didn't think nothing would happen to me at all. So I would I joked around in class. The entire class was laughing. I'm walking home. I don't even think anything of it. I come home that my mom asked me, Robert, how was school today? I said, fine, it was good, it was great. My dad comes home, he asked me, Robert, how was school today? Great. Around five o'clock, the phone rings. Guess who was on the phone? It was the teacher. It's almost as if right when they hung up the phone, they said, Robert, come here. I knew something was wrong. When I was called in, now I had chances to address it with my mom and my, my dad before. 
But sadly, with all of us, we get plenty of chances and we don't address our sins. So God has to address it directly. And, and that's what we see in our text. God addresses it. God addresses it directly. Sin is, as R.C. Sproul said, sin is holy treason against God. Sin says, I would rather follow Satan than follow God. I would rather follow his plan for my life than God's way. There are three things that he lists that, that that's how he addresses their sin. He's, he really <laughs> highlights Moses here. He says he's faithful, he speaks clearly, and he has the form of God. And the implication is, you have none of this. And you thought, by opposing my servant Moses, that I was not going to do anything? We all have people God has put in our lives to lead us and to guide us. They are your pastors. They are your teachers. They are your parents. We may not always like what they do, but our but, but they're there to help you. They're God's will for us so that we would go into the direction that, that God wants us to go. Next. The disobedience that leads to indifference towards sin causes us to join. Then God judges. Now our proper response is to plead for grace and mercy, plead for forgiveness. And that's what we see in the text. Look with me in verses 10 through 13. When the cloud moved from the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of her mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God. Oh, God, please heal her. Please. Very rarely do we see the consequences of our sin. Very rarely. We sin, and, and we don't see it coming until it slaps us in the face. When it knocks on our front door when we're not expecting it. That's what sin does. Although, the, although we don't see the consequence, when it does not, it is immediate. When it does not, it is immediate. Aaron looks to his sister, and it's almost like she is fine one, she is fine one second, then the next he turns, and she is white as snow. The consequences have come full blown for Mary and for Aaron. Now, Aaron and Mary both had a chance when God addressed their sin indirectly. They could have pled there, but no. But but that's like all of us. In order for in order for we have to stop by on the road to renewal and on the road to forgiveness we have to stop by confession there is no renewal there is no forgiveness apart from confession we must stop there and that is what Aaron does he pleads Moses please talk to God Please mediate on our behalf. When, please. And that's what we see in the text. Moses intercedes on Miriam and Aaron's behalf and they are healed. They don't get judgment. Israel had Moses. Who do we have? Is there anybody to intercede on your behalf? 
Anybody. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you do have a mediator. His name is Jesus Christ. And this is what he lives to intercede for you, for those who are believers in Jesus Christ. Isn't this what Hebrews 7.25 says? Consequently, he is able to say to the uttermost, those who draw near to God, since he always lives to make intercession for them. When you fail, when you sin, plead to Jesus Christ. He is the one who will forgive you, and it is through him that we find forgiveness. Will God forgive your sins? If you confess them, will he forgive them? Did God forgive Adam when he sinned? Did God forgive him by clothing him? Yes, he forgave him. Did God forgive Israel? Did God forgive them? When they made the golden calf, did God forgive them? Did God renew his covenant with them? Yes, he did. God will forgive you when you confess your sins. God will forgive you when you confess your sins. Isn't this what 1 John 1, 9 says? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God will take your disobedience and turn it to re renewal if you confess your sins. That is the requirement. There is no renewal, there is no forgiveness apart from confession. The only quite question now is, what do you need to confess? What do you need to bring to God so you can be brought into right relationship with him? What do you need? All you have to do is confess to Christ. Whatever sin is holding you back from a, from a, a relationship with God. And when you do that, you will be able to walk in the path that God wants for you and have everything God he desires. Let's walk in that.